Welcome back to Billboard Latin Music Week, and now it's time for our Power Players panel, and with us we have Rebecca Leon, the founder and CEO of Lionfish Entertainment. From Puerto Rico, Mr. Noah Asad, the founder and CEO of Rimas Entertainment, and from Los Angeles, Mr. Polo Molina, the founder and CEO of Grassroots Music. Welcome to Billboard Latin Music Week. Thank you for having us. So I want to ask each of you to describe in two sentences what your company does. And before we do that, I just want to note that Rebecca manages Lunay and Rosalia. Saint Pedro. And St. Pedro. Mm -hmm. And Noah manages Bad Bunny, Joely, Randy, and a slew of other acts which you can mention. Polo manages Gerardo Ortiz and Black Eyed Peas. And I know I'm missing artists, so I want to give each of you the opportunity to tell us what your company does. So we, our company cultivates talent, you know, at different stages of their, of their career. Um, we, we're always, you know, looking for talented people that write their music, that create content, that think outside the box, that are cutting edge. Um, yes, we manage Black Eyed Peas, Gerardo Ortiz, YG, Pablo Londra. Um, um, we just signed this kid, Luis, Luis uh, Escalera from, from Guadalajara, Mexico. He's amazing. Um, you know, we help structure their business and we treat them like a brand and, um, you know, use our experience and our relationships to take them to the next level. We're a one-stop shop, basically. When it comes to that is that we're based and found as a label, per se. And little by little, we, you know, cross over to different areas. Um, we do everything inside the industry, per se. You know, people used to, we, we used to hire us for advertising, for marketing techniques, from anything... High City Music Business has like 10 layers, and out of the 10 layers, we do all 10 of them. Um, anything from distribution, from administration, you know, purchasing catalog, we do a little bit of everything, um, to be honest. You know, it's like a one-stop shop at the end of the day is what we do. Um, every client is different, every situation is different. Um, you know, we have distribution deals, you know, you have record label deals, and you know, the, the, the sound's so similar, but they're two different worlds, you know. A distribution deal is something you put from A to B and a record label deal is when you invest in it like if it's your own, you know, like you're part of it. There's the, the artist management side, right, which is is uh, Rosalia, Dunai, St. Pedro, the, those three. And, um, and then we also have a content, Lionfish Studios, uh, where we're developing film, TV, um, digital content. You know, even books, we have a book situation that we're working on, it's getting into other aspects of IP and, and, and also creating more platforms for music to live in and, and also creating more opportunities for, you know, people that come from music to get into mm -hmm. TV and film, you know, and, and not just be so one dimensional, have really a lot more opportunities for the entire, you know, music community to grow as a result. I'm curious to ask all of you, what do you guys think is the largest area of growth right now in the Latin music industry specifically? Like, where do you see an opportunity right now? I mean, you know, it's interesting because I think, you know, the pendulum always ha finds a way to swing, you know, and so we're in a period right now where recorded music is, has a tremendous amount of value, you know, content, video content has more value than ever given that, you know, the touring not being there. Um, and, and I think just really, it's, it's forcing everybody to diversify, you know, their, their portfolio in a way that I think is ultimately going to be very healthy when touring does come back. You know, I, I hope that we don't all stop doing these things because touring comes back. We should still keep looking for these revenue streams and, you know, looking for, to grow the sector in this way. I think there's a lot of opportunity because, you know, with what's going on with this pandemic, you know, the other revenue streams, the other silos of the business, you know, sometimes when you're making all your money in one silo of your business, you're focusing more on that silo of business because that's where all the money and all the income's coming from. But I think the other silo, there's so many other profitable silos of the business that I feel like right now is the time for everyone to be creating. Right now is the, everyone to, Everyone needs to be focused. There's so much opportunity out there. You just gotta look. Uh, uh, streaming, streaming uh, music, videos, 
TV and film, like Rebecca said, uh, is a big opportunity. A lot of these artists have the platforms. Use your platforms to 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 dive and create and focus on these other silos of the business. What's very intriguing to me, what ex is the new opportunity I've been seeing, is that non A plus caliber artists. When I mean A plus caliber artists, I mean people that are in the elite zone. You know, you have developing acts. You have people that are legends that are, you know that deserve the world. You have acts that are in development. You have acts that are not in their peak yet, and they're on their way to the peak. And I see a lot of people endorsing those artists, you know, very prematurely before they're even an A status artist. And I think that's the coolest thing about the pandemic that you see, you know, sponsorships that you would never imagine to do live concerts, even the, this, even the simple content, you know. I, I see a lot of endorsements happening, especially in the Latin community. I mean, two years ago, you would have not seen any of this, you know, you know, from anyone from sponsoring something even for five thousand dollars, you know, you know, just make sure I have a little spot logo on my side corner, you know, in Latin music, you know, especially from where we come from the underground um, era, you know, is very new to us. So I see that's the positive in, in what's happening. All of you founded your companies when you were very young, when you were in your twenties, <laughs> and you've risen, you know, you've become very powerful players in this space in your own companies. What was the motivation behind launching your own company versus going to work somewhere else? What, what incentivized me to start was first was the passion that I had as a fan. I was a fan before an entrepreneur in the business. So that would be really my base and my foundation and little by little, you know, nurturing and wanting to know so much more about everything is when I little by little, you know, you get into management, then you get into like administering rights and then you get into the label side. So before you knew it, you know, a fan turned into an entrepreneur in the business. So that's that's how I started. So you come from a place of love for the music. How about you, Polo? You know, we, we grew up in culture, you know, here in Los Angeles. We were we were hip hop kids growing up and you know, we we lived the culture and when we saw that, you know, the, the, the clients that I started with since high school was was black eyed peas and when we saw that the level of the of the music was 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 as good as the level of the music that was playing on the radio at the time. Uh, we wanted to compete, you know. At the time, you were hearing um, the Fugees. At the time, you were hearing uh, Outkast, and we were like, "Our music's just as good. We need to get to a place where where we're competing with 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 them." And we were just very competitive kids that came from culture and you know like Noah said you know one thing leads to another first you you know you're doing merchandise then you're doing tour management then you're doing management and before you know it you know you organically grow a company and Rebecca I kind of love it when you talk about how you you actually did have a job at a label you were uh, yeah. doing ANR at EMI yes and then you one day you got a bank loan and you kind of up and left yeah um, I was 29 when that happened, and I basically, you know, I was it was a time when uh, the label, the music business was was very sick, you know, in the sense of like w there was no money coming in, you know, so like there were, you know, there was no streaming business. Napster had, you know, really buckled the business, right? But it brought it to its knees. So it was like a state. It was a time when you would go if you worked at a label, you would go there, and every day it got worse instead of better, you know, and so. I just felt like I wanted, you know, something else. And, and so a guy who used to be, I used to promote clubs on the beach and a guy who used to be my, my DJ, turns out he was only moonlighting as a DJ. He was actually a banker by day. And he uh, found me and he, he gave me, he's like, hey, if you ever want to start your own company, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll back you up anytime. So he, he gave me a loan and I left. And I left EMI and I started Lionfish Entertainment the first time with an artist, uh, with J.D. Natasha, a young girl who I had signed. And I think what I, what I think is fun about your 20s is that you really, really think that you know everything. And so you're fearless, you know? So you, you don't realize how big the risks are that you're taking sometimes because you are convinced that you're smarter than anybody in the room and you've got it all figured out and they don't understand anything. And so th then I think your 30s are really for learning and your 40s are for earning. You know, that's kind of like what it's been like for me. But, you know, I think in your 20s, you have to take those kind of chances. And, like, that's when you have the most freedom. You know, that's when you have 
your life is as little complicated as it's going to get. I, I'm smiling because Noah... I don't know, I don't know how you guys see it, but that's well, what I see. Well, Noah is in his 20s, isn't he? Noah, aren't you 29 yet, or did you turn 30? I just turned 30. No, 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 Noah's on the other side already. Oh, He's on the other God, side. Noah. okay. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so you see, but you take so many chances that maybe now when you're older, maybe as you grow, you see, oh man, I was really fearless back then. You did something pretty fearless, uh, few yeah. days ago, which was do this Bad Bunny concert. Yeah, that was amazing. In a bus along Manhattan, no? Yeah. yeah, it was a unique experience. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people involved to get it done. Um, one of the most, I hate the word stress, but I would say it's the most stressful moment of my life. But it was worth it, it was fun. We enjoyed the process. All of you have different artists and different deals with with uh, i know rimas is a one shop when uh, noah but you all have different mm -hmm. agreements with different distributors mm -hmm. and with different labels and with different publishers and uh, how do you decide what goes where and is the traditional label model something that is going to stay or it has that is that going to change forever? Or on the contrary, would, will COVID make it more appealing than ever? What are your thoughts on that? I think that people have to be educated better when they do their deals. Like if you are a developing artist, you can't, you can't come in and say, I want to own my rights, unless you want to get less money and develop your own product alone. And if you're willing to take that risk, well, you get, es como alta recompensa, alto riesgo, alta recompensa. That's how you say it in Spanish. Like, if the artist is willing to risk it all, you know, they got to understand what they're risking. You know, if they do a distribution deal, a distribution deal is putting something from A to B. Like, putting it from your cell phone to platforms. And, you know, I think that the educational process on that is very important. What's going to happen in the next two, three, four, five years is that a distribution deal is not what people think it is. A relabel deal is not what, you know, I think we talked about this earlier. You know, so I think that all deals are necessary because every artist is so unique and it's so diverse. Once you're at an A caliber level, obviously you can do whatever you want, you know, but when you're developing, you need that support. You need that e ecosystem to help you and support you in different ways. And not necessarily just being, you know, because we're an independent label at the end of the day, but you know, I think, you know, we got to figure out ways how to evolve with culture but at the same time, understand the value of what's being given to artists at the same time so they can develop their platform to where they want to go. I think the stature of the, of the artist, you know, like he said, every, every deal is different, every artist is unique, but the stature of the artist um, will tell you what type of deal you're going to do. If I'm closing a Sony deal with Gerardo Ortiz, who's the number one uh, most, most, number one, most, um, he has the most number ones in regional Mexican for an uh, individual artist in regional Mexican. If I'm closing a deal for him with Sony, it's going to be a different deal than a guy that just has a lot of talent, has no data, has no engagement, has nothing but talent, but everyone believes in him. The type of deal you're going to close with a, with a, with a label is going to be different than the type of deal you're going to close with someone that's already had proven success. Um, so it all depends on the stature of the artist that'll indicate what type of deal you're going to do. I love that it's so different from before, no? And, yeah. and Rebecca, your company, in fact, you started it as, did you always have the content side which you're developing very strongly now or is that, was that an add-on? It's, you know, it's officially now, like I'd say the last year really been something uh -huh. we've been focusing on. Uh, but just to add to, to the question, what I think what you ultimately decide, you know, as a team, you know, with the artists or whomever else is in, is in that, that group of people that makes decisions mm -hmm. with them, like you decide who, who believes in the artist most, you know, it's, it's not, it's not about a specific structure or deal. It's about getting people in the boat with you that really want you to succeed, you know, mm -hmm. that are really invested and are really excited. I think ultimately that weighs more to me than what could be, you know, a monetary a number on the, on, the, on, the, on the paper, you know, because some people will just throw money at you just to grab, just to grab it away from somebody else. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, that's not the kind of money you want either. You know what I mean? So I think you want people in your corner, ultimately, whether you're a manager or you're an artist or 
in any kind of business that want you to succeed, that are happy for your success, you mm -hmm. know, that are invested in your success, that's how you have success. <laughs> you don't get there alone, you know? So I think you always just have to build it around the people. It doesn't matter whether it's Latin or it's the country world or it's the hip hop world, everybody has, you know, their MO, right? Mm -hmm. And like, you know, when you jump into, a, you know, a, a genre or a culture, you just have to figure out, you know, what the way that, to respectfully do business, you know? And I think ultimately the most important thing is to be professional. Right, so it's like if you if you are a professional, and if you're good at what you do, people are always going to want to work with you, you know. But if you're unprofessional, if you don't respond to emails, if you're in pause, you don't pick up the phone, whatever, then it's like ah, you know, you can't work. You know what I'm saying? So I think you know the three of us, you know, are people who get things done. You know, yeah. like you call us, we pick up the phone, we answer our emails, we respond. To you know, you're on it. And I think when you're working in the general market, that's what people want: is for people to be professional. You know what I mean? So if you're if you have an artist that's professional and you act professional, it's seamless. It's seamless. If you try to bring yeah. bad habits into another culture, well like nobody's gonna want it. Not the general market, not the UK market, not the French market, not the German market. <laughs> right? So it's like, you know, we all have a responsibility to be professional at all times. Like so that everybody thinks about our business as like, of course, of course I'm gonna do this with this, you know, why not? Mm -hmm. You know? And, and Noah, you had no barrier of entry at all. You kind of just jumped right in, didn't you? I, I, I was for many years hustling, you know, in the Puerto Rico scene forever, you know, you know, 10 years, you know, in different types of areas. But little by little, you know, we were, you know, accept, accepted with open arms. I think what Rebecca said is very important that we answer the people, you know, that's I think that's a very important factor. You know, we're, we're, we're accessible. We're not inaccessible, you know. You know, I think the worst that you can get is like a 24 hour response, you know. When I, when I first started, you know, when Juanes like tapped me on the shoulder and was like, hey, you know, why don't you come to management? And I was, you know, terrified and I didn't think I could do it. And like I had friends like Bruno Del Granado and Fernando Giacardi, who I would call all the time, you know, and they would, they helped me so much. Pepo Perradas is still one of my mentors. You know, Walter, like we've all known each other so long. We've always called each other and like helped each other. Noah and I have talked about things. Bolo and I have talked. I, every, I don't know. I just feel like it's impossible not to help each other. Like I want all of us to succeed because I believe that there is room for all. Of, and I believe that there's room for way more of us. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited about, you know, finding those and cultivating those new executives. And hopefully there'll be many more women. <laughs> but, you know, I do believe that like it's, it, the, it's, we, it's the, we're our, at our best when we help each other. What to you, and, uh, and Noah, we can start with you, is the single most important issue that is facing the Latin music industry? Or let's say the industry in general and the Latin music industry in particular. What to you is the biggest challenge right now? Music saturation. So I think sometimes you just have to go back to the love of it instead of so much releasing just to release. If you're releasing with a lot of love, then release with a lot of love. And I agree as well that it's oversaturated. However, sometimes it takes for it to get saturated. Sometimes it gets, it takes for it to get saturated for something else to be, you know, like right now I feel like the music's really good and Latin is growing and Latin is not going anywhere, right? And Latin's become the new pop, the new, the new, it's like, it's like the buffet, right? I, 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 look, I look at music like a buffet, right? So the, in, in, the, in the buffet, they got, Latin mu they got Latin food, they got American food, they got French food, they got food from all over the world, right? And right now, the most popular dishes are the Latin dishes, right? And sometimes it has to get a little bit saturated for people to be thinking outside the box. That's what I feel. No, I want to say that my, okay, this is maybe a little controversial, but I, this is what the bane of my existence is, the need for constant collaborations and now to have three, four, five, six people on one song, it's, it's, it's killing. I, I personally think that is a massive contrib contribution to the saturation problem because now they're not on one song, they're like on five songs and they're not all their songs, they're different songs. Like, and it's like you go to radio to, to sing a song. Oh, but I've already, I'm already playing this song. I've already had this song. You're like, oh, but that's not our song. We got the other song. It's got us. And then it also has the other same artist and also somebody else and another art. 
Dude, and it's like, and then the, the, the number, the algorithm chasing, you know, that's a problem. You know, the, the, right. the, the fact that we put everything against this, you know, the, the numbers thing, and so many of these things with the five and six people on a song is just contributing to the problem that then later when you want to drop music by yourself, it's like, oh, that seems flat. It seems flat. You know, it only has like a hundred million, you know, and it's like, what do you mean? That's a lot. But it's like, of course, it's not a billion because we don't have six people on the song, <laughs> you know? So it's this, we've created this hamster wheel that we just can't get off. So beyond the time at home and the baby and the family time, <laughs> what was your biggest professional accomplishment? Rebecca helping me with read, uh, get, get J Balvin on Ritmo and Rebecca helping me get, um, um, Osuna on, on Mamacita and, and, and Gerardo Ortiz's uh, song, Otra Borrachera, that went number one. I mean, we were having, at one point, I had, I had, I had uh, number ones in two different genres in the same week, and I was just kind of like, oh shit, this is kind of cool going through this, this pandemic and still having number ones in different genres. I was, I was really proud of that. How many people, how many people saw the, the live stream, Noah? How many people saw it? I think it's 13.2 was the grand total because it was 10.1 on YouTube and then there was um, in Puerto Rico they had the um, Univision per se you could watch it you know as a broadcast channel and then we had you know you had the Twitch you had the Twitter and it ended up being like 13 million. So wow. good. That's huge. That, that's huge. It was the 108, 181,000 copies we sold with Bunny with six days because because Bunny wanted to release it on leap year instead of on a Saturday, instead of on a Friday. But if we would have released that on a Friday, we would have beat Little Baby. So, yeah. I, I, I feel that we got the number one, but you know, it's still, I think it's, it's something amazing that, that 181. But you know what I love about this guy? He's so humble about it. Look at the way he says it. He's like, he's like, uh, he's kind of like almost embarrassed to say it, but it's like, bro, come on. You have one of, you have one of the, you have one of the biggest artists, you have one of the biggest artists in our industry. Like, be proud of that. You do know that for a Spanish language album, that's the highest that's debut the biggest. in the history of the charts in the yeah. Billboard 200. Yes. yes. Amazing, 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 amazing. You know, first of all, I think this year, the, I'd say blessing, for me, blessing is Lunai. You know, him, him and Chris and Gabby coming into my life, like, it has been amazing, for real, amazing. I feel so blessed. Um, I think accomplishment, not to diminish any of the other things we've done with, you know, with, uh, with Rosalia, and you know, we have this amazing deal with Mac, which is incredible, but the Nike deal, you know, being the first female, you know, artist to be the face of a Nike campaign globally, had a, you know she's the face of, of Air Max for a couple of years now, and it's like all of that means it's like a lot of check marks. It's big, you know, yeah. it's really big. Yeah, well, congrats to the three of you. You've had, wow, you've had a great twelve months, and uh, and I hope it keeps growing, guys. I can't wait to see what you do between now and the end of the year. I, I want to say something. I want to say that I, I respect you guys so much, and I'm so happy to be sitting on this panel virtually with both of you. And I can't wait to see you guys in person. And honestly, I, I think that you guys have had the most incredible run, so I'm really, really proud to be sitting here with you guys. <laughs> and, uh, and we and are healthy. very, very um, thrilled that you accepted our invitation today. Uh, and I thank think you. this is fantastic and inspiring. And thank you so much, Rebecca, thank Polo, you, Noah. Thank you. And everyone stay thank tuned you. for more Billboard Latin Music Week.